feel so privileged when I get the opportunity to walk through the forest. My tupuna used to touch these trees. How amazing is it that I'm lucky enough to be able to do that as well? For Te Kauramaka, it's really their heartland. So this is the beating heart of the iwi in terms of their geography. This is who they are, where they are. If they're not there, they're nowhere, basically. From the day I started in the beginning of 2013, it was on the radar. When it was described in terms of this type of pathogen, Te Kaurau Maki asked Council, what do we do about it? Discussions were at a low level, so not, a, not really a decision-making type of level, the engagement, which to me reflected, uh, I guess, a lack of seriousness on the part of our treaty partners, which was um, council, but more so the Crown, in my opinion. And then we go from 2013 to 2017, when the, the next scientific report came out from Auckland Council. And it had shown that the infection rate had essentially doubled. There was action in terms of research happening, reports being written. However, Te Kawarawa Maki, we wanted to exercise our right of mana motuhake, which is self-determination. And um, there's only so long that you can write reports for. Kia ora everybody, uh, my name is Conrad, I'm a Tane Mahuta ambassador and welcome to the Waipo Forest. Tane Mahuta is the largest living tree in our country and he's the fourth largest tree in the world. Before I tell you guys how old he is, I'm going to tell you how they start. The seeds have a wing on the seed and it's designed to catch the wind so it flies off to the side, hopefully out of the shadow of its parent tree, into some sunlight where it starts to grow and then 2,000 years later, you'll have something like Tane Mahuta. Tane's a pain in the ass because he brings all these visitors in here and they upset our nahere. <laughs> We've pumped him up to be that symbol of, of Tane, the representation, the manifestation of Tane Mahuta, the, you know, the, the atu of the nahere. We've placed that burden upon him. I can't believe I'm saying this, but you know, you've got to, you've really got to, you've got to understand Tana Mahuta is one, one tree in amongst the whole forest. Physically, Waipo forest can be looked on as one of the last remaining old growth Cody forests in Aotearoa, New Zealand, which also means the world. Waipo forest has also been a bit of an experimental ground as well. On one side of the river here, you've got beautiful old growth forest. On the other side of the river here, you've got pine plantations, which, you know, which is a legacy of the Forest Service days going back to 1920s, 1930s. There's a rich history here in Waipawa, and a lot of the decisions that were being made back in these times were with absolutely no regard to my ancestors and the people that were living here at the time. That really emphasises the importance of the role that I'm doing now. Because of the iconic tree status of trees like Tani Mahuta, first response was to make sure we were in the conversation. We could have said, 
Tane Mahuta, we could have said there's a rahui over the whole forest. I felt, and it was supported by a number of people, that it would not have been respected. So we had an opportunity to do something differently to what was being done by getting a really good baseline understanding of the state of health of the trees right now. So we have a database of just over 12,500 of these trees in Waipa. We'll be able to see in two years' time, in five years' time, that hang on, there's some trees over here that were healthy five years ago, but now they're starting to decline. What's going on over there? In that spiritual sense, humans entering that space uh, a bit like a pathogen going into a space. We can upset that healing process. There's cultural barriers to uh, an acceptance of te ao Māori as legitimate. People get very panicked that something's going to be taken off them. It's natural in some way because there's not that understanding, but I think it's deeply unfortunate that a large part of New Zealand is still like that. You combine that with a growing prevalence in our society for a distrust of science as well, saying, no, it certainly can't have been humans that caused this. So these two things combine into this quite toxic, I think, distrust. Iwi groups don't play sarahui so they can get on TV. It's, it's about the protection of the resource in their space. Other iwi have done rahui for a long time and will continue to do so. I think the difference is because this one has been in the public arena that there's been more kōrero about it. I live in a country based on a treaty and being Pākehā, it's my responsibility to listen to the kōrero coming from our partners and to respond and look after that. That specific four hectare area around Tane Mahuta is now probably the best study <laughs> four hectares of Cody land in New Zealand. Oh. Reasonably confident to say that Tane Mahuta is uninfected but is in amongst an infested area. Doing together. It used to be gravel from Kaihu all the way through. So that's what would stop people from coming through. And then once they got tar sealed, that's when people just started hammering the place and then more people would come through. We need to ensure that we're doing as much as we can to prevent the spread of the disease. You know, we've got a pig hunting operation happening at the moment, which is trying to limit their potential to spread the disease. But it's pretty well accepted, I think, that humans do have the ability to spread far and wide. 80% of dieback affected trees in the Waitakere's were zero to 50 metres off track. Whereas, you know, the deeper that you got in, it significantly dropped away. Management is not, we're not managing the forest. The forest can look after itself. People can, you know, people can bugger off and the forest will be fine. What we need to manage is how we control human behaviour in the forest. <laughs> I used to be against keeping the forest open. 
oh, we still want to close it down to protect our forests. But then it's kind of seeing the appreciation that people get from, from seeing big giants like this. If we close it off, they don't grow that appreciation for the place. The weight of all of these other little trees and their roots woven in with his roots and also the protection they give him from the wind is why he's been allowed to stand here for 2,000 years. That's why kauri trees will only grow to the height of the secondary canopy. Notice how the trunk stops at the height of all the other trees? Because if you grew really tall, like an umbrella, he ends up shading out all of his family, all the whānau around him. And if he shades them out, they don't grow. If they don't grow, he hasn't got that support. And without that support, he falls over. And so that's the lesson he's trying to teach us. And it's a good lesson for us as humans to learn. Because even though we're the most dominant species on the whole planet, we've lost that wisdom. Thank you guys for listening. Thank you. Tone is very central for Tororoa because we can take people that are Tororoa but may not have ever been to Waipawa, we can take them there and say, this, this is where you're from, this is home. My goals to achieve is really setting up a good framework for the future where people can come back to a place like Waipawa, have a job, you know, do some mahi that is having a contribution to the health of the forest because for us in Tororo we have a saying, ko o ko te ngahere, ko te ngahere, ko o. I am the forest and the forest is us. Culturally, this country's been built on kauri. We've lost these trees once already through our own greed and destruction. And now, just as they're fighting back and recovering and growing again, we're about to lose them again. Morning, uh, my name's Mel. Thank you so much for coming and volunteering. This is just awesome to have so many people um, to, to have a blitz on Ross and Anne's property. As you can see, they've got very large 10 acres with lots of kauri. All these trees probably have kauri dieback. Most of them have really clear kauri dieback symptoms of thinning and, and basal bleeding. And so what we're going to do is do some baseline monitoring of these trees today. So we're going to collect a load of information on their health status, as well as treat them with a chemical called phosphite. This treatment is not a cure. Phosphite knocks back the uh, phytophthora in the tree and enables the tree to sort of fight back. It also seems to give the trees some kind of immune boost. We don't really know how it works, but it seems to stimulate them. If we lose kauri from the ecosystem, then it takes the 17 other species that depend entirely upon kauri in this forest type with it, and you will get a complete change in the balance of the ecosystem. So it's very, very frustrating to see that 10 years down the line, really, we haven't moved forward very far. We've got a serious problem that's all over the country and spreading every single day to, to new places. And still, we've got Department of Conservation refusing to close tracks. Um, Minister for Conservation, who doesn't see this as an important issue, and nothing has changed. Right. So are the basal bleeds present? We're saying yes. Yeah, bleed height, 56. Yeah. And the number of injections is four. It's not just about the people who've got kauri on their property. I mean, that's what we originally thought, that the people who had kauri would be flocking to us, and then they'd treat their trees, and then they'd act as like a knowledge base for their neighbours, and they'd support their neighbours, and you'd get this sort of snowball effect. Well, that's happened a little bit, but nowhere near the snowball effect that we've had from the people who don't have kauri on their property, who just want to do something to help. 100.0374. Canopy. Three and a half? I think it probably is three and a half. It's quite a lot of dead branches. Yeah. So we're building relationships, basically, okay. which is, you know, what all yeah. social science is about. And it's, it's, that's actually about what all motivation is about. It's about what all volunteering is about. 
It's about what life is about. Around Titarangi, the majority of the trees are less than 200, 300 years old because it was all logged and cleared and farmed. And yet they still have this awe and wonder about them, that people are living among them and revering them and wanting to protect them and buying their house because it was surrounded by kauri. And to think that we can kill that with a thing we can't even see, that we can move a thousand spores on a pinhead of soil, is horrifying. Yeah, so I didn't have any choice but to go and protect that forest that, that supports me, enriches me. Why would I let it die? But there's obviously still pest control happening here. Yeah. And then I guess you also need to take into account the numbers of, like, the foot traffic that's going on it. For example, you know, like, the numbers at Kitty Kitty is huge. Ultimately, we knew we couldn't just have it sealed off forever because we knew that there'd be a segment of the population that would not give a damn. If we didn't have a pressure valve, that compliance levels would dive and that we might uh, we might win a few battles but lose the war. The number of people going into the forest has drastically reduced. The fact that people are talking about Cody, talking about Rahui, there's an absolute indicator of success. The majority of people understand why this was done. As soon as the iwi said, you can't go in the forest, or please don't go in the forest, everyone went, why not? And then they listened. And that was what the difference was. And that had never happened before. No one had actually listened. Whether it'll be enough, I don't know. I mean, it's a heavily infected forest. Those trees that are infected are going to die. The fact that this disease is happening to Kali is a real gift. These trees have an effect on people, and that gives us an opportunity to use that to lead us to a, a future where we all understand what our role is in the overall ecology. To me, the Kauri is symbolic of ultimately how good we are as a country, as a people, to the place that we call home. This is a test. <laughs>